Well, welcome to our North Sidebound Roundtable. We're trying something out a little bit here, some video. You can decide if you want to see our, our mugs <laughs> later or if you just want to listen to the audio here. But we're, we're back with the North Sidebound Roundtable. It's officially the season uh, for the minor league 2022 season has started. We can finally talk about minor league baseball and not feel like it's off in the distance. My name is Greg Zumack of Northside Bound. I'm joined with Todd Johnson, Greg Huss, and Jimmy Nelligan, the four writers, the four founders of Northside Bound. Fellas, it's good to have baseball back. How are you doing? Hell yeah. I, I'm loving it. I, I love that we get to talk baseball. I'm loving that we had opening day for AAA season. I love that Friday, it, it's kind of nice having Friday night be like opening night. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a loser, so I'm not doing anything with my weekends anyways, but like, it's kind of cool to have like Friday night be like the night, you know? You take off work, Greg, you just uh, going to prepare all day for, uh, for opening day. No, it's it's kind of nice that they're all night games though. That's that's for sure. I I uh, I tweeted out yesterday. I've been sick the past couple of days, so I was able to watch uh, the Iowa Cubs opening day in its entirety. Although I was working from home, but I was able to watch uh, have it full up on my screen there and watch a lot of the Iowa Cubs games. So that was that was pretty sweet. It was a uh, a nice benefit of being sick. I guess I'll take it. Very good, Todd. You pumped for the season. Uh, yeah, especially since uh, Brendan Davis just walked for the second straight time today after striking out three times yesterday and seeing half the people overreact yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see um, the low class A kids um, get going to, on Friday night and South Bend get going, and uh, yeah, it should be. Should be interesting to see the the final rosters for Tennessee here in the next couple of days too. So well, pretty fantastic, cool. you know. Uh, so I want to give a, a shout out uh, and a little bit of a plug on the website. So if anybody wants to check out at least our best guesses on on these affiliate rosters, now Iowa obviously is known that's been released, and by the time this is out, it's possible that those are out there too. But we took some pretty good best guesses at the rosters, so make sure to check those out on the site. So Iowa Cubs. Tennessee Smokies, South Bend Cubs, and uh, Myrtle Beach Pelicans. We've got affiliate previews. Well, Pelicans will be out on Friday, but that might be by the time this is out too. Uh, so make sure to check those out and um, give those kind of a whirl there. It's going to be a long season. There's going to be a lot of transactions, a lot of movements, but this is where things are starting out. And folks, I want to kick it out to you. What were some of the big surprises that you s- at least heard from some of the stuff that's come out here on as far as the any roster assignments that were a little surprising to you. Yeah, I I was stunned to see Owen Casey at South Bend. I thought for sure that he would be back at Myrtle Beach to begin the year, but he did not look um, phased at all in in the spring training games with the major league club. He actually did really well. So I'm I'm excited to see him in Davenport here in a couple of weeks. So. It's going to be a lot of fun that week. Yeah, that's a fun one, like, on the side of a guy being promoted, not a little promoted, a guy, a guy being sent up a level higher than we expected. Um, I I look at, there seem to be a lot of guys get, like, shifted down a level, right? I mean, because of, and this happens every single, every single year we, like, do these roster projections. Guys get shifted down a level because the Cubs sign minor league free agent deals with, with minor league vets, major league vets that get like sent down to Iowa. Right. And so the Iowa gets filled up with all these guys that are 32 year old free agent signings as opposed to like prospects. And so then you get guys like uh, Cam Sanders and Anderson Espinosa sent down to, to Tennessee and then Max Bain sent down to, to South Bend and then Tyler Schlafer sent down to, to Myrtle beach, you know, so like it's shifted throughout the entire system. So, I think that's where most of the surprise, I mean, quote unquote, surprises came from was just the the shift. Uh, I and mean, we saw that with with some outfielders, with some players in Tennessee too, um, as far as the position players go, with uh, Nelly and with uh, Morell getting sent down to, to triple or to double. Well, actually, both Nelson Nelson Maldonado and Nelson Velasquez getting sent down to double A um, when we kind of thought there was a chance that he, they'd be in Iowa. It was nice to see Ed Howard not get caught in that shift, though. How he got that promotion in the South Bend. I was 
I wasn't exactly surprised. I think it was about like 50, 50, whether you went to South Bend or spent another, uh, season in Myrtle or not a full season, but just a little time in Myrtle beach. So it's nice to see after his, uh, how he ended the season last year, how he ended off, uh, pretty hot in the spring that he had too. It's nice to see the Cubs still kind of believe in him. They still want to push him a little bit and he didn't get caught like in that shift to kind of get like sent down a little bit to the level. It's nice to see him start in South Bend. Well, yeah, that's I'm, pretty great. And yeah. Penango uh, is supposed to be in high A as well as for South Bend. I think that's pretty exciting. Talk about a guy yeah. with a big hit tool. He got a, he was really young and got a promotion to high A last year, you know, more tried to, tread water at that point but an aggressive promotion got to go back to high a again this year which is just a vote of confidence and you know i'm excited to see what he can do he's pulling the ball with a little bit more authority from what we've heard so i feel like we sometimes forget about yo hendrick because i mean there's so many young guys in the system but also pinango's very young too like you, like you said 20 years old he's in a high a he's performed well statistically um in a tough league to hit in last year so uh, I just feel like he's a guy that we sometimes forget to talk about. Yeah, I put in my preview that comes out tomorrow that he um, will likely be the first hitting prospect to move up uh, to Tennessee. I, th- I think he's that his approach is that much more advanced than anybody else that, except for, well, now that Beasley's at South Bend. But, um, yeah, he could probably be the first guy up to Tennessee, when, and he'd be at double-A – at 20, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, that's a pretty impressive track record. So, well, folks, we've got some questions. And uh, let us if everybody's ready, let's just dive right into them. Yeah, let's here. do it. All right. Well, I've got the first one pulled up here. want to give a shout out uh, to a couple people who sent in questions and, and one that <laughs> definitely uh, fueled the podcast episode, roundtable, whatever you want to call this today. But um, first, I want to give a shout out to VND uh, on Twitter. And he asks, which prospects would you sell high on? This, I think this would be an interesting question. Uh, but which prospects would you sell high on, either now or if their value raises because of risk of reg- uh, regression? And so he gives the examples of Braylon because of reliever risk or t- Chase Trump because of a right-handed position uh, and ceiling. So not that we have to jump in on those, but folks, I, anybody want to take the first stab at this one? This is kind of a hard one, especially as we have kind of all the enthusiasm about watching these guys again. Um, but you know, anybody that you would necessarily sell high on or however you want to take a spin on that question. I'll go. Mm-hmm. Um, I think any of the young outfielders that the Cubs have that are at like low a or rookie ball, I think you can sell high on, I think, most of the guys at at double A and triple A are you're probably not going to sell high on. I mean, there's just there's a track record. Uh, they know the potential versus production element is already in there for them. So there's a lot more unknown, and sometimes the unknown is a little bit more sexy to a buyer than uh, a used car. Basically, it's, you know, if you want to bring in an analogy. I mean, that's kind of what it is. Do you want a new car or do you want one that's a little bit used already? So I think with the used car, you kind of know what you're getting, um, but you're not really sure about the young car that really hasn't been tested yet. Well, you've heard it here first. Todd <laughs> Johnson called Brennan Davis a used car. The used car. Of, <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding, of course. I know, Todd, I got what you're saying on that. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Greg yeah. or Jimmy, what, what do you think on this one? I think if, I don't know, like I'm trying to think about just like trade scenarios. Like if we need to grab a starter, like at the deadline or something like that. I, I would go, I think Todd's right. Like someone younger in a position that we're pretty full like on in the system like we're pretty pretty plugged on like middle infield like even like a young middle infielder we could go you know kind of trade get like a high end like starting pitcher like if we even if we want to do like a hernandez or like an ed howard or like a kevin made i think all those guys could be on the table and same with the outfielders like like ta was saying like we have so many like 
young outfielders. And even if it's just like a package deal, like if we put like a uh, Ismail mania in there with like uh, Ed Howard and uh, maybe just like an older prospect, like maybe like a Morel or something like that. I feel like that could get us like a s- good starter if we're like really looking to buy at the deadline. But as far as just like, who I want to just get rid of. I don't know. Like it's, it's hard to like look at it as like, who would I sell high on right now? Like that's such like a difficult question. Cause I feel like just for me, I'm a lot more like optimistic about like prospects in the system. Like Marquez makes a little bit of sense. Um, just kind of like coming off of injury a little bit. And, you know, his questions about if he's going to be a starter reliever, I feel like he's like, makes sense in this scenario, but I don't know. I, I really just don't want to like get rid of like a lot of young guys, especially right before we kind of watch them play baseball. Yeah. So I'll throw out there that, I mean, I actually struggled with this question when I saw it first for one, you know, and this is, and, and thank you so much for the question. I appreciate it. Um, but I don't know that I would, I would throw Marquez in as a sell high right now. Right. Like in a way we haven't seen, people haven't seen him throw for a while. And, and he dealt with, COVID and the myocarditis that actually came with that, which is very unfortunate and has lost a couple seasons effectively because of that. And so I don't know if, if you're selling them now, I don't know that you're selling high you're now. Selling let's low. say, yeah, I would argue you're selling low. Now, yeah. if he comes out smoking and you know, the Cubs start fielding calls, then yeah, maybe, maybe that might make sense. I could, I see like the overall premise there, but yeah, I would really struggle with selling now. Like at this point, it's almost because you're just taking what you can get for him. Um, you know, so I, I, I gotta go back, uh, with Todd and and Jimmy a little bit and, and even give a little bit of a, a backwards look at when NSB Northside Bound collaborated with Guardians Baseball Insider this winter, we did like a mock trade, tried to figure out like a true, like prospect for prospect trade. And the guy that I finally settled on after like, I mean, I probably bothered everybody on this call way too much with our <laughs> Slack messages and whatnot of just like, hey, would would we actually move this guy? But the guy we finally settled on, and it was still kind of pulling teeth a little bit to do it. I didn't want to do it, was Canario, Alexander Canario. Because like, he's a guy with unbelievable tools, and he's at a position where we have some depth uh, as far as like a right-handed hitting outfielder. It doesn't mean I want to move him. I really don't want to move any of these guys. I'm with you, Jimmy. Uh but like he's finally the one that I was like, if we have to do this trade and we can bring in somebody of need, maybe that's where I'd go. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I I'm gonna go with Eric Yardley here. Um, I think that he's the <laughs> Eric Yardley or Connor Menez or uh, <laughs> no, I I think that the Cubs are loaded. Like, who are the two guys that that Indy mentioned? He mentioned Marquez and then somebody else here. Chase Trump. 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 Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that those are two actually two examples of guys that might be like selling low on definitely Marquez uh, a little bit with Strumpf. I think the Cubs are loaded with loaded with guys in the system that are sell high opportunities. Um, we talk about all these guys that are like borderline top one hundred prospects that we have yet to see and play in full season ball. It's like if we're that high on guys that we have yet to see and like like play actual competition then those are like prime examples of sell high guys. I'm talking Preciado, Kevin Alcantara, James Triantos, all the guys we love. Every single guy we love, those are the, those are the sell high guys because they haven't had a chance to fail yet. They are they are going to fail. Like as soon as they hit full season ball, they're going to hit Myrtle Beach and they're they're going to go through a month long stretch where they don't hit. Like that's going to happen this year. And if it doesn't, then you're talking about a top 25 prospect in baseball. If it does, you're talking about a normal human being, but he comes back down to earth where like now you know what that trade value is, you know? And so I, all of our favorite prospects in, that are going to be showing up in, Myrtle, in the Myrtle Beach lineup this year, those are the sell high guys. And I, I, I can't even like really peg anybody above that level as being a sell high. I, I think that Canario might be the best example of that because we know that like the tools are – so impressive. I think that, that Nelson Velasquez falls into that same category with, uh, with Canario. They're just like super toolsy. Like we know the power is outrageous. Like those, those, those skill sets are like something that teams can dream on. Um, but yeah, I think those are, those are pretty clearly my answers. I guess, I guess it's just like the, the guys that we would 
we don't want to move. But you'll see you'll you see guys on on Twitter to kind of dabbling in that though of like, oh, who can we trade for a starting pitcher? But it's like I also don't think that we're the Cubs are ready to compete at the major league level right now. Um, so would a trade really be worth that? I I'd say probably not. I think you just see what actual value you have as opposed to like perceived value. Nice. Any other thoughts on this one, folks? No, that's a great question. I love how much it hurts for like all of us to answer it. Just seeing <laughs> Zumax reaction when Greg just even mentions James Triantos' <laughs> name as a potential <laughs> trade is just great. <laughs> <laughs> but he's right though right like yeah. he's a guy i mean to bring up triantos i don't want to make this isn't the triantos podcast but um but like to bring him up he's a guy that we took at 56 gave him a first round money and then we get, like you hear stuff in the winter that they're that teams are like there's no way he would have made it past you know pick 30 anymore like the way people view him now but to greg's point we haven't seen him fail and for all these guys, like that's like the quintessential definition of selling high. So yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I think I think it's a great thing, and it speaks to the optimism of this, optimism of the system. Like a few years ago, there were maybe a handful of people, and now mm-hmm. it's like you think about some of these names, and you're like, this is going to cause me like emotional harm <laughs> to, to think about moving him. I'm glad I'm not a GM. I guess I'll say that. But. You know that every podcast we've done the last three or four times, you always bring up James Triantos, and then you always disclaim it by saying this is not the James Triantos podcast. Well, it's I, always the James Triantos <laughs> pod, podcast. You just, you just can't market it as such. If, I don't. If I it's don't. always the James Triantos podcast, it, is it never the James Triantos <laughs> podcast? It's I always. Know. I, I'm not ready for like a baseball like paradox thought experiment right now. I'm just trying to get my head around like these affiliates. So, all right. Well, maybe this is the James Triantos podcast. Um, well, but you know, I, I I'll dive into a couple of the other questions, and then you know, hopefully Todd can can jump in on some of these too to okay. to lead us off with them. But I want to give a huge shout out to Don Hyman, who yeah basically fueled this entire roundtable. Uh, passionate guy who follows us always great interacting so thank you don for your questions i know at one point you even apologized for all the questions do not apologize we yeah. love the questions don always like, sends us in questions on the growing cubs pod too uh for us to answer to so don is the man That's maybe awesome. this yeah. is the don hyman Thanks, podcast don. instead it there is, you yeah. go that's it um that's Sponsored right by the don hyman auto group <laughs> hey, there you go. Uh, so, you know, I'll kind of jump in on a couple of these and, and we can kind of take them, take them as is. But uh, Don asks, with all top five prospects in baseball ready to graduate to the majors, how high do you see the Cubs system rankings climbing to by the All-Star break? Anybody want to jump in on that one? That's a hard one. I don't know. By the All-Star break, I... The All Star break is hard um, because the guy, I think the guys that I, I mentioned before that we're expecting to kind of carry the system to the next level, um, all those young position players, a lot of them are going to be in Myrtle Beach. And we know that offensive production doesn't really happen all that much. I mean, unless you're an incredible hitter, uh, the offensive production is hard to come by in Myrtle Beach. And so. Uh, this first half of the year, they're gonna get, they're gonna be adjusting to new pitchers. They're gonna be adjusting to playing at on the beach there, where the, the ball doesn't fly out. Uh, they might not put up numbers, which means that they might not get a whole lot of love as far as prospect ranking goes. Which I don't think is necessarily correct, but I think from a national pers- national perspective, you need to you need to see that. Um, so I'd say by this time next year, I think that the system as a whole is gonna look a whole lot better by the all-star break, I'd say you're probably not seeing a whole lot of difference um, as far as where the Cubs system stands. That's, that's my opinion, at least. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Todd. Hey, I don't see a lot of movement um, until after the draft. And then really after the trading deadline, I don't, it, you know, and and also it depends on who's uh, doing the ranking of the farm system. So, you know, you have some have the Cubs in the top 10, others have them in the 20s, and then others have them in the teens. So 
Mm-hmm. It, it all depends. But yeah, I, like Greg said, I don't see a lot of movement till probably late in the summer. I mean, you figure by this time next year, you got like a full year under their belts for all the young teenagers. Plus you have the first round, the high first round draft pick this year. Um, plus you have, I assume that the Cubs major league team will be trading at the debt. Like we'll be selling off the deadline. I, maybe they'll surprise me. Probably not. I don't, I don't know, but I assume they're going to be trading away some pieces, which means they'll be getting prospects back. Now, I don't think there, besides Wilson Contreras, there's not anybody really on the major league roster that can be traded for like top tier prospects, but you add some depth. That's always, that always helps. So I don't know. They could bump up. <clears throat> five or six, seven spots uh, between this time this year and this time next year. Jimmy, what do you think? I, I kind of agree, but I do have like one caveat and that's Brennan Davis is probably going to be graduated by then. Mm-hmm. So I think just in general, our system might even move down a little bit within the next year before it moves up. I think potentially just because our system is still so young and I don't know if even in a year, like we're really yeah. going to have like that top kind of guy like we have with, Brennan Davis like we might have a few guys that crack like a top 100 list but I think it's still going to be like another year or two I think it'd be even longer than the trade deadline before we kind of move up there I don't think we'll like move down too much I think we'll probably be pretty like stagnant for the next like year or two we just need to let like the teenagers develop I feel like once like our Myrtle Beach team is in like double a I think we're gonna have a better idea of kind of where we rank Overall in the system, I think we're going to shoot up like into a top 10, probably even higher than that, like top eight kind of system, especially after like a couple of drafts. We still have like Wicks up there. I mean, we have so many potential top 100 guys. It's just like letting them kind of develop into the players that we think they can be. So we have a lot of sell high guys right now. We just uh, need them to perform. Yeah, that's a good point with Brennan too. I mean, between Brennan Davis and Caleb Killian, there's your top hitting prospect and arguably your top pitching prospect, um, both probably graduating out of prospect status by the end of this year. That's tough. That, that's tough on any system. It, no matter how much like impress, how many impressive prospects you have coming up to the system. Yeah. I'm, man. I mean, you guys bring up a lot of good points. So I guess it depends. I think I forgot who mentioned this, but it depends on who's doing the rankings, right? Like if it's fan graphs, they put a huge emphasis on the lower level guys, like in in the ACL and whatnot. And who knows when some of that luster kind of shine, you know, loses uh, off of a few of them. But <clears throat> Pipeline had the Cubs was it eighteenth, I think recently. Overall, yeah. does that sound 18th. right? Eighteenth, yeah. and they put a pretty heavy emphasis on, you know, like adding in the draft people. And the Cubs picked seventh and. They, I guess it depends on by the All Star break, right? Like if you're talking about like the Friday before the All Star break, then they won't have that number seven overall pick. If we're talking about at the end of the year, then they have that player in, presumably, provided there's no like crazy Kumar Rocker type situation. Then that's like a huge addition for most in all likelihood, uh, according to Pipeline. So, yeah, I mean, I generally do agree with people here. I mean, I think we there's a real possibility that it kind of looks in that same range, like 15 to 20 kind of a situation, according to Pipeline, um, at the mid-level. Because we won't, we won't have this number seven overall pick. We won't have any other draft people in, in the team. It's possible that Brennan is graduated. I kind of do wonder if he is or, or if he still has rookie eligibility. But, you know, I guess we'll see on that. Then yeah, I don't know. I I don't think things are going to shoot up in the next six weeks. I guess. Yeah. So, great question, Don. We're going to be hearing a lot from you today. So thank you very much for the question because you started us <laughs> off on a fantastic, good one. Um, and so I'll ask uh, this next one, and then uh, Todd, if you want to jump in here. Um, oh, we do have a we do have a draft question. We do have a draft question. <gasps> so. All right. Okay. Uh, so wait, 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 said, wait, let me get ready. All, All right, right. everybody, put your draft hats on. <laughs> okay. So Don, Don asks, uh, and this is a good one. I'm I'm really intrigued by this. Uh, I keep seeing mock drafts that have Jace Young falling a bit in the draft. If somehow Young 
Jace Young and Dylan Lesko are both available. Who do you draft? Ooh. Both. Both. That's right. Break the rules. <laughs> there are no rules. Seven <laughs> A and seven B. Mm, that's really tough. Um, Todd, do you want to take a first stab at this one? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would take Lesko because I don't know when you're going to have a chance to get that kind of arm again. I, I really don't. Um, and I, I've said that before, so it's it's not a secret, but. If you have the top pitcher in the draft is available and he's 18 years old and his stuff is ticking up and he's got a projectable body, then you take him. I don't, I don't think there's any kind of waiting, you know, get the card to the podium as fast as you can. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. Um, so this is a really great question by Don and it's timing up and not. So I, I would take Dylan Lesko. Uh, if I'm just looking at the numbers, so I was just checking my my upcoming re rank. Uh, so it's on my my sheets. I haven't uploaded it to the website yet. But Dylan Lesko, Jackson Holiday, who we, uh, Todd and I talked a lot about on our recent draft show, and Jace Young go five six seven, all with a grade that I've got graded of of fifty five. So it's like razor thin. I'd take Lesko. I I don't think he would be there at seven i really don't i i I know like it's it's april so we don't want to make some big grand statements about what's going to happen in july when things are super volatile but it provided there's no health things i think i'd be pretty surprised the way people talk about dylan lesko is this like super almost a respectful way of talking about dylan lesko I, i can't describe it any other way just that they've got a tremendous amount of respect for like how he goes about his his business, like what he does on the mound, and how impressive that he is. And prep arms are risky, but like there's not a safe college arm in the, there's not a safe college arm with any any way close to the level of ceiling uh, of Dylan Lesko. So in some ways, he's like if you want an arm and you're picking in the top five, like he's your guy. So I'd pick I'd pick Lesko. Uh, Young would be amazing, and then I'd also be totally fine uh, with Jackson Holiday or a number of other players. I'll, so I'll piggyback off that question. I don't know. I don't. I don't really have anything to add to that. I don't know, Jimmy. I don't. I don't. I'm assuming that you don't either. I don't know. I'm not qualified to talk about the draft okay. uh, in <laughs> April. <laughs> so instead, I'll, I'll piggyback a question then to you guys, to Todd and Greg, and and ask. I guess with this pick in the first round, you're looking at 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 young and you're looking at let's go do signing bonus concerns play into either of those guys in wh- why you would or would not draft one of them yeah uh so i don't want to get too much into signability and i and i can't say anything for certain because really i i have heard that that those numbers don't get thrown out there until like yeah closer towards the end but but like let's look at the commitments right so jace young if he is sitting there at seven, I don't. I would be pretty surprised with his profile if he's like, I need an overslot bonus. Yeah, I, I exactly. just would be surprised. Yep. Dylan Lesko is a Vanderbilt commit who has like, I mean, he, he has borderline one one potential now. I don't yeah. think that happens with the profile, yeah. but like, if he goes to Vanderbilt, like he could be Jack Lighter but better, yeah. <laughs> and so he could say like, I want like $8 million or something Mm -hmm. crazy. And maybe that plays into it. Uh, I, again, I've got these guys sitting at 55, 55, 55. So there's like minute things related to risk and overall ceiling that I have in there. My model is kind of rudimentary, but so like I do have less go higher, but if you're telling me that it's going to be like a one and a half million dollar difference, I can't, I can't say that I would argue that, that less go would be worth that. Um, I have no idea about those numbers, but like, I'm just spitballing off the top of my head. But I mean, that's based off assumptions where like the history of those types of players getting drafted. I mean, we're we're not speaking about those players specifically, but a a top high school arm with a commitment to Vanderbilt versus a college bat that, and they, they typically have, have similar signing bonus, uh, uh, structures Mm and over the, over the history of the draft. So yeah, that, that, that was just interesting to me. I was curious. So. Yeah, Todd, what do you think on that? Because I'm, I'm 
you you may feel very differently. I know you're huge into yeah. Lesko, and I can't argue with that. Yeah, I think the the signability factor <laughs> plays more into the six picks ahead of the Cubs. So um, some of those teams are notorious for signing an underslot player in the first round just to save a couple million dollars. And you could see a whole mess of people uh, available at seven that were not there, that you didn't think would be there because somebody um, reached down to pick somebody to sign for, you know, 75% of the slot rather than 100% of the slot. So I don't think the Cubs will have any problem ponying up money for whoever they sign. So <clears throat> the yeah, issue totally. is... So looking at last year... signs ahead of them. What? Oh, no, I was just going to say, so looking at last year, Jackson Job went three overall, and the top arm in the class... Uh, oh, actually, okay, I take that back, sorry. Jack Leiter went two, but, but Jackson Job was the top high school arm in the class. Got $6.9 million. So, you know, I don't know. Yeah, like, and that would be probably well over. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) I can't believe I didn't even catch that. And uh, so that would be, that would be what we're expecting is a little bit more than the draft order slots uh, for the Cubs at seven. So, yeah, I mean, it's possible. It's possible. It plays into it. I, yeah, I'm fascinated by that. I, the other thing, and I, Todd was just getting to this too, there's usually a surprise in the first few picks, like somebody mm-hmm. that you don't necessarily think. So if somebody is, I mean, we sat here in 2020, the world was crazy, and Austin Martin looked like a consensus number two overall pick, and he got popped by the Blue Jays down a few picks. Yeah. And that caught everybody up. you know. And, and he had certain requirements, so they're like, if there's that kind of talent that all of a sudden should go number two or number three that's sitting there at seven, the Cubs have proved to be very opportunistic. Like if, and that's awesome. Like if there's just a really amazing player, just go get him. And then just think about, you know, the considerations later. Yeah. Sweet. Don, you're on a roll. Todd, you want to take us through Don's third question? Yeah. Um, Let's go to Myrtle. Let's say, let's do some lefty pitching here. Uh, Don asks, uh, would anyone be upset if Luke Little, Braylon Marquez, and Burl Caraway were the back end of the Cubs pen in three years? Jimmy, take it away. Whew, three years. That's a I, good question. I think I'm, well, I mean, I think we're going to need a righty in the pen. I don't think we're going three lefties to yeah. for three straight innings to close a game, but. I mean, I could see, I could see something similar to that happening. I think, I think Luke Little, I think he's going to start at Myrtle Beach this year, but I think he's definitely long term a reliever. I think Marquez is. I mean, the more we talk about the more Marquez, the more you know. I kind of lean towards him being a reliever too. And then, I mean, same thing with Caraway. Caraway is just a reliever. I mean, that could be three guys potentially going the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning that are going to be throwing a hundred with a good hook while well, in Caraway's case and Marquez possibly we're still kind of yet to be known about Luke Little. I think with Little still it'd be a little bit more time for him to develop. But I think with Caraway and Marquez we'd see him sooner than 3 years. I think probably in a couple, Caraway maybe even next year. But I I don't see it happening that way with the three of them. I think it's probably going to be like one or two of those guys, but I don't think the th- three of them. I don't think we're going to have three lefties in the back of the pen giving us a seventh, eighth, and ninth in three years, especially guys that young. Yeah. So I've got two things here. First of all, uh, did you guys know that Luke Little's middle name is Justice? I was not aware of that until I pulled up his baseball reference page. That's a sweet middle name. Uh, (laughs) Second of all, I would be like thrilled if those three guys are the back end of the bullpen in three years, like I, I would be very because that means that Burl Caraway has reached his peak of what we expect him to be as a reliever, like as a prospect, as a player, um, because we expect him to be a back end of the bullpen guy. Um, that means that Luke Little has gotten to the major leagues in three years, which, like Jimmy mentioned, that's that's probably pushing it a little bit. And so, if he got there in three years, that's a really good sign. Um, and then Braylon Marquez, like Jimmy mentioned too, it's like we're leaning towards bullpen anyway. I think that's that's the guy of the three 
that is not the net positive of, of, of that grouping um, because you'd like to see him as a starting pitcher. But like, I'd be more than happy with Brendan Marquez being either a, a one inning lights out guy or a multi inning, pretty good reliever. So uh, give me those three guys, seventh, eighth and ninth inning in three years. I I'm more than happy about that. Do you see that happening though? Do you think it's like no even <laughs> remotely possible? <laughs> no, I don't think it's possible. I I, I mean <laughs> because I think that that's that's so great, like that's so ideal world scenario that I just I don't think that's going to happen. And, and you're right about the, le- the lefty thing, like that. I don't know. I I think if you get outs, you get outs. But like also, you can't have three lefties doing that. I guess I don't know. I I think that um, I am. The guy that I'm most confident in fulfilling one of those three three roles would probably be Marquez. Um, I think if I'm picking one of those three guys, and then play goes Marquez, Caraway, Little, because I just don't I, I I'm I don't have Little on on uh, like top prospect list and things like that. I think that he <clears throat> could be for sure, but um, yeah, I, I don't expect that to be a thing, but. <laughs> I would be very happy if it was for what that's worth. Yeah, man, I tended. So I, I want to echo what Greg said. First of all, it's like, would I be ecstatic about this? Yes, I would totally be ecstatic about this because this is, this is the like baseball America, make a roster out of your prospects, like fever dream <laughs> that I always get caught up in. Right. Like I, who is their shortstop in 2025? It's, you know, Ed Howard or something. I, I can't remember what was in BA. Same kind of concept here, right? Like you just take three firepower lefties and say, what if they just went seven, eight, nine? Like that sounds great. I don't know that I necessarily buy that, but I'll even put like a more oper- um, optimistic spin on it. I don't buy that because of the way that the Cubs have been performing in building these relievers. Like, I didn't have faith in the way that the Cubs built their bullpen in years prior. And now they've, there's stories about, you know, finding guys and teaching them sweeper sliders. And there's this, like, everybody's popping 99 and a hundred. I feel like, I feel like they'll have the ball boy throwing, you know, 92 <laughs> here in a little bit. Like it's just, maybe there's hope for me. I'll be able to crack, crack 80. Like, I don't know. And it's just, what they're doing is so impressive from the bullpen side that these guys 789 isn't really likely because they are really truly building this bullpen core that is is amazing and impressive and we haven't talked about like Nunez or uh Dennis Correa or like any number of Bailey Reed is is popping stuff Frankie Scalzo just it's just so impressive Greg what do you think I'll I'll tack I'll tack something onto that a little more the, the history of what the Cubs have done with prospects, but more on the negative side a little bit before kicking it over to Todd. But um, the Cubs have also shown that they really don't like converting starting pitchers to be relievers. They they will do every single thing under the sun before converting a starter to a reliever. And some people like that strategy. I don't really like that strategy, especially with the way that baseball is going, where starting pitching goes fewer innings and you're looking for guys just to get outs. But what I care about doesn't really matter in this argument. It's more about, I don't see the Cubs. I, I think the Cubs will hold on to Brandon Marquez as a starting pitcher, whether they want to see, keep calling him a weapon or not, Jed Hoyer in his press conferences. I think they'll hold on to Brandon Marquez as a reliever, or sorry, as a starter as long as possible. And I think now that they've converted Luke Little to the, ro- to the rotation, because I think when he got drafted, the assumption was that he might be a reliever. Um, but with him looking more like a starter, I think that's a project they're going to go all in on for at least two years. So, um, for him to be in a Chicago bullpen in three years, is probably unlikely. And I just think that's a, that's a history around the Cubs that is more on the negative side of things. But Todd, what do you think? Um, I'm wondering what Don has against Brandon Hughes, because I, I think Brandon Hughes is probably going to be, he, he and Caraway could be the first two there. Um, even though, you know, they talk about Jed Hoyer talked about, uh, Marquez being a pitching weapon this year. Um, and I, right now I just don't have a lot of trust in Braylon being ready yet. So after missing basically two years, but I think Brandon Hughes 
should be in that discussion as well. I think he could be a guy that um, really takes off. I mean, he looked good in spring training, uh, right up there with almost every Cubs minor league reliever that that uh, they've groomed the last few years. They look fantastic. So, um, how, about, how, how about a back three of Brandon Hughes, Ethan Roberts, and Ben Leeper with Kane Eckert throwing the sixth? And if, we're, if we're doing this Baseball America, like just projecting out our roster, Kane Eckert Burl six, uh, and then and Burl gets the yeah Burl gets the fifth. We'll just we'll just have one inning relievers every single game. I got to give Scott Efron uh, some love though. He Scott has Efron, looked so go. good this spring, and he is going to just yeah. eat so many innings in the Cubs pen this year. I feel yeah. and he threw so many innings last year, dude. Yeah. Like, he threw a lot of innings last year. Like that's he did give point, us sixty right? innings, like in the Cubs pen this yeah. year. Yeah. Like, that's the whole point is that we could we could have this be the bull- this is no longer the James Toronto's podcast or the Don Howard <laughs> podcast. It's always yours, Don. Don't don't get ourselves. But we could just build this whole thing out of the bullpen because we could go for still, a bunch of time and talk. We about haven't guys. mentioned uh, Manny Rodriguez. We haven't right. mentioned Scott Kobos. Like there, we could just yeah. we could just keep going and going. It's, Brian it's Hudson. Brian, yeah, your boy Brian Hudson. Estrada. Yeah, it's. Estrada, yeah, it just keeps going and going and going. And like, yeah, those are all relievers. Like, those aren't, those aren't like, oh, starters that might get com- converted. Those are already reliever, relief pitchers. And so, if you can put together a list of what was it, like 12 guys, 11 guys, like, like legitimately 11 guys that have like major league relief pitcher potential, okay, if five, if less than half of those hit, you can still almost fill out a major league bullpen. Like, that's amazing. I, I love that. Yeah. It is amazing. And to your point, Greg, which I think is a very good one, like historically, they just haven't been quick to convert people. We'll see if that changes. I do wonder with Carter yeah. Hawkins in the yeah. mix here what, what that does. But um, we have Secret yet sauce. to see Cam Sanders out of the yeah. pen. And yeah. obviously I want him to be a starter, but like, yeah. if you're telling me right now you added Cam Sanders with his stuff and his moxie, Slim no. down to just a couple pitches Moxie. out of the pen. Yikes! Yeah, that's a big I, I, league I, I, arm in my book, even yeah. with the control issues. Yep, I can totally agree. Know. Yeah, Don, great All question. Right. Yeah, great question. All right, uh, this is a I I just love this question. So um, he says, "How would you compare 2014 and 2022?" I see high upside equal to 2014. But this group, I think he means 2022, being much deeper. How do you compare this core of prospects Cubs have now to Baez, Solaire, Bryant, that era? Shit, what Russell. was I doing in 2014? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was reading I think... Cubs then. Well, I okay. just started my blog. Um. I'll, yeah, I think Don kind of summed it up is that the, the high-end talent, like, there's better high-end talent. Let's not kid ourselves. Like, I, I love Brennan Davis, but in tw- at the end of 2014, you had three guys in the top 20 prospects in baseball. And I know Addison Russell sucks, um, but, like, he was a top, like, five. He There were some places that ranked him ahead of Chris Bryant. And you had he and Chris Bryant in like the top five, and then Jorge Soler in the top 20. Javi Baez was still eligible, and there's just no way that you could compete with that right now. Like PCA, Owen Casey, uh, they could just nail the number seven pick. Uh, Brennan Davis somehow maintains his rookie eligibility, and like that's still not gonna, t- they could go nuclear, and they're still not gonna touch that. But the depth is like crazy, and we don't even need to reiterate the bullpen stuff. But like the starting pitching is there, that wasn't there last time. You had I can't I don't think I don't think Kyle Hendricks still had eligibility at that point. Um, so you didn't have, and he wasn't really highly regarded either. You just have so much better pitching and so much depth, and like maybe in a couple of years that high end talent all is in Double A, like Jimmy said earlier. All the guys in low A are kind of in double A, and then Baseball America and Pipeline like ranks them really high. Um, so yeah, I love the depth. I'm really encouraged about this, uh, but they don't have like four guys in the top twenty. The, 
the Cubs, I'm looking at the 2014 MLB Pipeline um, Cubs Top 20. They had three guys in their Top 20 did not make the major leagues. Three guys in the entire Top 20. Corey Black, Carson Sands, uh, and uh, Bijan Rademacher. Um, those three guys did not – every every single other player did. That, that's amazing. Like, it's not – and, and, and you're right, it's, it's like the Chris Bryants and um, Kyle Schwarbers and guys that like actually made like actual impacts in the majors. But then there's also like depth guys. But it's – the system is not that um, – I don't think – I think if any system is ever that, it's insane. Like that, that, that's, that's not normal. That is not normal in any stretch of the imagination. So uh, I think our system is really fun now. I think that – it was fun then too. And also better. I, it's not, it's not even a not like saying that that system was a lot better is not even a knock on it. Now. It's just like saying that like, was that was the number one system in baseball <laughs> by a long shot and still holds up eight years later. It was the system that broke the curse effectively. Yeah. Like yeah. it's a historic type system. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, you had MVPs, you had NLCS MVPs, Glaber yeah. Torres is ranked 14th. Glaber Torres yeah. is ranked 14th. <laughs> Eloy Jimenez is ranked 12th. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's it's absurd. It's it's, like, it's, it's silly. It's I mean, it's silly. do we even have like a top, say, 10 prospect like in all of baseball in our system right now? No. no. I think Brennan's just off of that. Yeah, I think so yeah. too. I think Brennan's probably the closest. And I think maybe like, I don't know, like even like Christian Hernandez, like I don't, know if he could be ever like a top 10 like prospect in all of baseball or anything i don't i just don't think we have that guy i don't think we have that guy in our system right now i think i i'd actually argue that i think that christian hernandez is probably i mean not not closer right now but i think christian is most likely in the Mm -hmm. system to be a top 10 prospect in baseball i don't think i mean to be a top 10 prospect in baseball is incredible so um i think outside of christian hernandez i don't I think there's a lot of guys that could find themselves in like the 25 to 50. A lot of like I think there there's like legitimately like eight guys that could find themselves in the 25 to 50 range at some point. And that's a, that's a lot of dudes. And then that's not, that's not all going to happen. Like that will not happen. But uh, yeah, it, this this system is just not even on the in the same stratosphere as 2014. Yeah. Yeah, I look back on that though. It, it oh man, uh, the memories. Uh, <laughs> and so I I will say, Jimmy, like I think Christian Hernandez has a pretty decent chance in the future. Because if you, so, if you look at the top ten, uh, in in the top hundred, so I don't know how we're going to say that. C.J. Abrams, Anthony Volpe, Bobby Witt Jr. Stud. Three, yeah, three <laughs> shortstops in the top ten. Um, they kind of carry those positions. And Noelvi Marti is at 11th. Uh, and Marco Luciano is 13th. Mm-hmm. I think all like all really young shortstops that just got a chance earlier, and then they were they just have superstar potential. Yeah. But I mean, I if the whole point of the 2014 is you had three guys in the top 20, mm-hmm. and like I don't see that. Like, I love some of these prospects. I think they've got all-star potential. But is there, like, an MVP? Maybe Christian Hernandez. And, and like, if you're really bullish on Brennan, who, of course, we love. So, yeah, I mean, this, that class is just crazy. It was just crazy. For what it's worth, too, I, I, I'm going to say it now because I, I've never really, like, I've never had a platform to put it out, but it's coming in conversation now. Bobby Witt is my number one prospect in all of baseball. Bobby Witt is yeah. incredible. Like I know Adley Rutschman's very, very good. Um, the J Rod show in, in Seattle, terrific. Bobby Witt is the number one prospect in baseball, and he's going to be really good this year. As what, like twenty years old in Major League Baseball? That's yeah. I, I'm big on Bobby Witt. I hope he's an All Star this year. I really, I think awesome. that'd be amazing for Kansas oh my God. City. I think I that's that. so fun, so fun. Um, for what it's worth, Todd, we'll kick it back to you. Uh, I'm going to interrupt with a question because I don't know if you guys saw this. We got a question just tweeted at us um, from Nick, like literal minutes ago. So, uh, Nick, if you're watching this back, 
Uh, I had a question about um, can you guys do your best to get everyone as hyped about Jordan Wogu uh, breakout season for 2022? Um, I think that for the most part, Nick is preaching to the choir here. I think that that we we've done a pretty good job of like hyping up Jordan Wogu, and and we've <laughs> kind of held our our points as like we knew that the first half of the year was going to be a lot of like changes for him, swing wise, mechanics, all that good stuff, um, and it proved to be the case. I I'm not like full on throwing the first half of the season out, but like kind of like because we, we know he was working on stuff. So like if if that's all new to him, if it's like not how he's used to doing things, then why should we grade and why should we like scout his abilities from that first half of the season? Second half, he obviously tore it up and um, we saw him hit that home run in spring training. What, what was that? Two days ago, yesterday, where he like yesterday. yanked an inside fastball. And like, that is like the Jordan Wogu strength. Right. And um, I household name, I, I'm curious to see like where he ends up like in the grand scheme of things as far as like rankings and stuff like that. I think that I think that people recognize Jordan Wogu's name uh, outside of like prospect circles. I think the Cubs fans recognize Jordan Wogu's name and like already. And I think that will I think he'll be a household name by the end of the year. I don't know where he'll be ranked, but people people know who Jordan Wogu is, I think. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's really holding him back from being rostered at this point he was good enough to play yesterday Mm -hmm. um but i don't know what what's going on there but he just needs a place to play every day yeah and he will i mean i i I assume he'll be eventually assigned to south bend um that south bend outfield is stacked i mean wogu eventually you got pinango you got owen casey we mentioned um and then alexander canario is there too um, not not a great defensive outfield, but uh, <laughs> it's Canario an outfield that can hit. Go get it. Canario can go get it. I, I think I think Canario is a, a right fielder long term. I, I think yeah. he, he's he. I think he's in the same like Brennan Davis, um, Nelson Velasquez to a certain extent, like where they can play center field now. I think Brennan Davis is a good center fielder now. I think Alexander Canario is a good center fielder now. I don't think that they're center fielders long term. I think they're all probably right fielders. I would say at least. Yeah, Jimmy, I'm, I'm really one. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, I wonder if they like. I don't know. I don't think it's that bad if he gets more just like instructional kind of work with Mogu. It's. I feel like it's two things. I don't think his swing really is that bad. Like when he came into like the system, we talked like a lot about kind of just how hitchy it was. And I think he fixed some things mechanically with this swing. Like it's not going to be the prettiest swing in the world, but I mean, he can still turn on pitches and hit them like to the moon. So, I mean, he's not having like an issue getting there. I think it's more of just his plate discipline. Like I remember watching his first spring training at bat and it was just like three straight sliders in the left-handers batter's box. And he swung over the top of like all of them. I think it's more just kind of pitch recognition and having more discipline at the plate. And I think it's more just like, maybe even less instructional and more just getting like a lot of reps. And I think just seeing more like just professional pitching and just seeing more like experienced professional pitching, you know, like he, he did have that struggles at the beginning of the year last year, but I think he definitely made those adjustments like in low a. And I think he could hit like, okay, low a pitching, but I think, for his development, I want to see him hit like higher, higher pitching a little bit, especially with how old he is. I think he, I think he's okay mechanically right now. I think it's just like his play discipline and is even like just the pitch recognition. Cause I mean, if you're swinging at like a slider in the left-handers batter's box, like, Oh, Oh, it's, Mm -hmm. it makes me think that it's more just him kind of seeing the ball and like what pitch it is and recognizing that more so than like something mechanically in a swing. Yeah, that's fair. You know, it's kind of interesting because he talked to Lance Brzezowski last year uh, and gave kind of a breakdown. And then he echoed some of the stuff in the off season with me about like kind of turning his hip. It's actually, so this is, this is hashtag not a comp. And obviously the swings look very different, but the way Seiya Suzuki, who Jordan technically Wogu is Seiya Suzuki. That's right. <laughs> this market, book market. Uh, Seiya Suzuki, number 37 overall prospects, according Ooh. to BA today. There you go. But 
how he does like the hip turn kind of showed some of his butt and then like unloads on the ball. Well, Nuogo had a lot of success kind of incorporating that same idea, very different swings. Um, but two guys with unbelievable power who, you know, we'll, we'll see how against different pitching, the contact rates all shake out. Um, but Nick, if you wanted us to get hyped up, I mean, you're speaking to the right, the right folks. Like I, was impressed uh, with Nuogu even defensively. And I think that's actually a very underrated part about his profile is that if you're asking Jordan Nuogu to be what we talked about at the draft time, where it's like, ooh, this guy is maybe a fringy left fielder and probably a DH, that bat's got to be extraordinary to kind of make that, right? And now like he's a guy you could throw maybe he's in a few weeks your south bend center fielder until pca takes over and like if you're talking about a guy that can kind of just do oak average ish in center field uh long term that's a pretty impressive profile like you don't have to do as much so i'm i'm optimistic about nooku i again don't know why he's not necessarily on a roster but hopefully he will be soon maybe it's just something minor Dude can just absolutely move too. I think oh, yeah. I mean yeah. we talk about how good his speed is, but I think even that's a little bit overrated. Guy can fly. Especially defensively to too. Yeah. I don't think he loses a step like in the yeah. outfield. I picked what do you him think to about lead, Nuogu? lead the Cubs in stolen bases this summer. So all right. Uh we got a few questions left from the Don Hyman show. Um Let's see here. Uh, on opening day 2025, what players from the system do you slot in that lineup? Mr. Zumak, you're up. Okay, so this is like the BA thing, right? Um, Baseball America, try to uh, slot everybody in. Okay, I'm totally just going to do I didn't catch this question, so I'm going to do this off the top of my head. Um Okay, uh, so it has to be somebody from the system? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'll do something kind of unorthodox, just because I can't... I think they go outside... I think they go outside the system for catcher. I do. Um, but let's just do something fun, and let's say Bryce Windham at catcher. And uh, this is like the whole lineup, right? Yep. Okay, all right. Then I'm just going to hammer this I, out. I'm assuming position players. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely not. I'm not <laughs> touching the rotation. <laughs> we'll get to the rotation. 25, in 28 man roster, whatever. Um, okay, I'll just hammer this out. I'll go first base. I'll do Casey. Uh, second base, I'll come back to shortstop. Kevin Made. Um, Third base, James Gerontos. Ah, man, that, that doesn't leave much space for anything. Uh, second base, I don't know, Christian Hernandez. This is going off the rails. Well, you better put Ed <laughs> Howard in second. Three years? I, yeah, I could. I could. All right, yeah, let, let's do Ed Howard in second because maybe Christian's not up yet. Um, this is like a, a, a preseason 2025. <laughs> and then uh, slotting around the outfield. I have to go Brennan. Um, I'll say PCA and shoot. I don't know. I'm probably missing somebody, but let's just go Velasquez. Gosh, that was, that need was, a, that need was a rough. DH too. Oh, and a DH. Yeah. Uh, hit me up on that one later. I don't know. <laughs> Maldonado. It's a good one. Penango, maybe, 2025? Yeah. There you go. Jimmy, who you got? Catcher. Do you want me to do all of them? I could do – how about I do a rotation? I'll do the rotation. Is that okay? Sure. So, I mean, we're going to have Killian. We're going to have Wicks. Try and think who else is really going to be just, like, up there. Like, Marquez, maybe. You could have, like, a – Corey Abbott, maybe. South Bend guys could be up there, like Cole Franklin, Palencia, Max Jensen. Payne, Jensen. Yeah. Ooh, that's going to be tough. Okay. 
So I'm going to go Killian, <laughs> Wicks, Jensen, Franklin, Bain. I think that's going to be my one through five. And then I'm not even going to mess with the bullpen right now. <laughs> everyone, <laughs> everyone in Iowa and uh, Tennessee right now. The guys, we've already mentioned is the bullpen. Mm-hmm. We, we mentioned like twelve of them, so I think oh, yeah. we got the bullpen covered. Yeah. It's um, Eric Garrett's season. I'll, I'll I'll take a crack at the lineup. I I, I the the rotation is tougher. Um, I'm with you. I think they'll probably go outside the system for catcher. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I don't think it'll be Wilson anymore. I don't think. Amaya. I'll, I'll, I'll take Bryce. I'll, I'll take. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's Amaya. I keep forgetting about Amaya because he's out. Um. Yeah, I'll go with Amaya. I I, I like Bryce Windham as the backup. I, I dug that Zumak. Um. I'll go Amaya, and then I think that twenty twenty five. See that? That's tough. Twenty twenty five uh, window is tough. Uh, I'm gonna go Owen Casey at first. I'm with you, and then try to fit the second, short, and third. Give me Triantos at s- second. <laughs> give, give me Triantos at second for now until I shift him over to third if I can't find somebody <laughs> right. Uh, give me give me Triantos at second. Uh, give me Ed Howard at shortstop, and give me um. I like, I like uh, Preciado at third base. Give me Preciado at third, and then in the outfield, I like Brennan Davis. I like, um, give me, give me PCA. I'll stick PCA out there, and I will also have Kevin Alcantara. I don't know if I don't know if all those guys are going to be ready by twenty twenty five, but I'm saying it anyways. And then uh, the DH is. Cambalego. The DH is Cambalego. That's who I'm going with. <laughs> and then give me Christopher Morrell playing everywhere all across the diamond. That's my lineup. There you go. All right. I'm going to go with the stunner here at catcher. I'm going with Casey Ovitz. Oh, uh, like good it. call. Like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. That's and then nice. uh, first base, I'll make it unanimous. We'll go with uh, Casey. At second base, I see um, Triantos, shortstop, Ed. I'm going to have Ed stay there. And then I'm going to have Christian Hernandez uh, be up for a second season at third base. And then in the outfield, I'll go Davis, um, PCA. Uh, I'm going to go Canario and right field. And then my DH is going to be Cole Roterer. I'm going to go with, stick with Cole. because that I like is, Cole. I like that. that. I hope Cole does so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, Todd, I just think that's pretty baller that you're saying, if I heard you right, that Christian Hernandez is making like a 2024 debut. Yeah. All right. I Two and a half years, That would be pretty awesome. Now I there's your could... top five prospect in baseball. I, type yeah. upside if that happens. Well, I caught some flack for saying that he could be at Myrtle Beach this year because his, pit, his hitting coach in the Dominican last year is now the hitting coach at Myrtle Beach. Yep. So – he could be staying in extended spring for a while, and he could be debuting at Myrtle Beach uh, June one. You know, kind of like Mate did last year, come up yeah. mid year and get some experience. In. I think that's good. I think I forgot Espinoza too. I think I do like <laughs> Killian Wicks, Espinoza, <laughs> Jensen, Franklin. I think that'd be my one through five, which is a really good one through five. Yeah. Great one through five. We we have more Don questions, but we're just not going to be able to get to them today, Don. So <laughs> now nah, we're going to hit you up on Twitter or something about it. You've you've fueled the entire episode, which is so appreciated. Seriously, I know we were kind of joking around, but really, it was awesome. Those are really good questions. Yeah. So, well, folks, I think that's a great way to end it. I mean, we talked lineup, we talked bullpen, we talked optimism, gave a preview of the affiliates, threw out a little draft question, just throwing it out there. Dylan Lesko is absolutely shoving right now, um, popping 97 with unbelievable spin rates, apparently. Those are the messages that I'm seeing. So, hooray. 
I guess. Uh, but otherwise, this is great. Hopefully, we're going to be doing some more of these roundtables. Let us know if you like them. Let us know if you want more audio or if you do like the video on these. We kind of might do some mix and match, do a little bit of both on them. But, folks, I- I'll say it. You know, go Cubs. Uh, we're here at the, at the start of the season. Make sure that everybody's got their MILB TV subscription. Uh, we don't get any kickbacks on that. But, um, but it's great to be watching these players I know that, you know, the the major league team kind of hit or miss. Who knows what's going to really happen with this season. There's not as much optimism on, on all sides of town there. But uh, the minor leagues, there's this, this is a system on the rise. So let's um, – we finally get to see some of these guys actually in action. So with that, I'll say go Cubs and uh, cheers go to Cubs. all you guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Thank guys. you, guys. Appreciate it.